one of the students suggested I show block center positions. And actually, I like block center positions and I have good record with them, except for the games that I lose. So let's see, I wanted to flip the board without doing it the right way, just to get in your craw. Okay, good. And um, when I have a block center, it's always the same because I play the same crazy opening a lot, which nobody plays. But I have a good reason for playing it. Back in the day, when I lived in Belgium, your favorite country, right? Yeah, see, yeah. Uh, I played in a tournament that was like game in 30 minutes. And one of the players in the tournament was the current world champion, Vichy Anand. And he kept playing this weird line I never saw before. And I'm like, I can play a weird line nobody's seen before. So I've been playing it since that tournament. And that is where uh, Black plays E5. Now, if you play the Benko Gambit, or if you're from Europe, the Volga Gambit, that's B5. And most players here play E6, which is the Benoni. Um, but E5 is a, you're closing up the center, which I only did because I knew several years later Joe would ask me to show a closed center. Yeah, okay. And you get, I've had this exact position many times. And white obviously has the advantage because white has more space. But most of my opponents are confused as to what to do because the center is closed. So they sort of play like the center isn't closed and their moves don't make any sense, then they lose. And then I get my prize money. So, and then I get a check. So, the class dismissed. Oh, no, wait. So <clears throat> when the center is closed, generally you want to play on one of the flanks. And in fact, both players here want to play on the flank. White wants to play F4 eventually, or B4. And black wants to play either F5 or B5. Now, in general terms, if I had to bet, I would say black plays F5 more often and white plays B4 more often because white has more space on the queen side and you want to keep going with your space and getting more and more space. And this is a problem for black because I, I can't play bishop E6. I can't play knight C6. It's not fair. Okay, now, <clears throat> yes, or Sarawan, who I think works here maybe. What, is he here? No, or he's just visiting for a couple days. Okay, so Yasser, so some guys don't get humor. So Yasser, who, who stole every job I've ever had, <clears throat> when he has black in this position, he plays g6, bishop g7, castles, and then knight e8, and f5. Um, or, or, Yasser also plays bishop e7, and then castles, and then plays knight e8, and g6, and Fianchetto is his knight, and then plays f5. Yasser has done both of those. Okay, I don't do any of that, because that's not what Anand did when I watched Anand play. Okay, when I watched Anand play, he didn't castle. He played knight d7, knight f8, knight g6, then he castled. And I was like, hmm, I never saw that before, which means my opponents never saw that before, which means when I play it, my opponents are always confused. So whenever I play this position, I had this position many times, my opponents sit here forever and just play really strange. They just make moves and nobody ever follows the same path. So this guy plays h3, this guy's rated 2200 plus tax. And I, I don't know what h3 does, I'm not going to g4. So okay, knight bd7, he plays knight e2, he's gonna do the same rigmarole I am. He's gonna to go to f5, I'm gonna to go to f4. And yay, I castled. And you don't have to castle. In fact, some players, when their opponents play knight e2, they like to play h5, h4, which I've also done, and try to stop the knight from going to g3, or kick it out. But okay, I wasn't interested at this point. And my opponent played a3, because he wants to play b4. I agree with that. And I play h6. Now, h6 is key when I play this opening. And that's actually my first question for the audience. Why does black play h6? So he can move? I got it. You. So he can bag the knight that's on f back, and then make way for the rook pawn, the f pawn to go up. That's mainly correct. I am going to play knight h7. And I am going to play f5 eventually, although he played knight g3, so he sort of made it tough. The reason I want to play knight h7 is this bishop is a little suspicious. It's not very active. And I want to play bishop g5 and trade it for that bishop. 
because this bishop is behind all these pawns. Now, when I was in Soviet Russia, which it actually was Soviet Russia, in 1984, they told me when a bishop is behind all of its pawns, that's the bad bishop. So that's the bad bishop and that's the bad bishop. So they said in Russia, maybe they said the opposite. Oh well, I'll never know. Okay, so, so generally you want to trade these bishops if you're black because this bishop's pretty passive. So you're right, I want to play knight seven and eventually f5. My opponent played knight f5 before I could move my knight in. How could he do such a thing? And I played knight h7 and I'm like, all right, take this terrible bishop with this beautiful knight, that's fine. And he didn't do that, he played on the queen side. And I defended the queen side, hooray. And he castled, and I played the move I said I was gonna play, trading off my bad bishop. And he said, no, we're not gonna trade, and he, he kept the bishops. Now, strategically, bishop b2 might be okay, because you're not trading off the bishops, but man, that's a really terrible square for the bishop. Like, he can't play rook b1 and get the open b file. What's, what's that gonna do? So my bishop is actually on a nice diagonal and his bishop just sits there and can never do anything. So I don't like bishop b, well I like it, I'm black. Okay, now in your professional opinions, and when I say professional, I don't mean chess, I mean whatever you guys do. In your opinion, which white piece is pretty good right now? That five knight, so we gotta get rid of that guy. Okay, so I'm gonna play g6 over my knight. Oh wait, I can't do that. So let's play knight f4, my knight's good. And I'm gonna kick out his knight with g6. He can't kick out my knight because his pawn's hanging. He played knight e2 to kick my knight out. I kicked his knight out. It's sort of like Barney chess, right? I kick you, you kick me. Isn't that how the song goes? <laughs> I think so. Dinosaurs are tough. Okay. <laughs> Knight back to g3. So he's wasting time. He, he goes knight here, knight here, knight here. I kick him out. He's like, all right, and he goes back. Okay, so I like black's position because that bishop on b2 I think is very suspicious. Bishop to d7. Ha ha, developing my bishop. He didn't see that coming. Now it's hard for white to do anything, even though the point of the lecture was what do you do? Well, I've taken control of the king's side, I kicked him out, I got my pieces nice, and by playing bishop here, I control some of the queen's side, and the queen's side's blocked up. So he's not getting his advantage, but eventually I'm going to win on the king's side. That's what I was hoping. Knight takes, he didn't know what to do, so he just randomly took something. And I took with the pawn, and now I'm attacking his knight, but he saw it. Now why did I take with the pawn? Well. He has two choices, or as my dad would say, one choice and one alternative. Okay, he can play knight h1 or knight e2. What would you do? I would go to h1. Well, if my opponent plays knight h1, then I'm glad I took with the pawn. Although knight h1 might be better. The problem with knight e2 is I get a quick attack on his king. Something like that. Let's see, this guy's a master, what did he do? Knight h1, see there you go. I remember what he did too. Okay, so knight h1, not exactly where you want your king, or your knight. Bishop f6, he tried to avoid trading bishops, but I wouldn't let him. Now I wanna trade bishops, which I already said, but also I wanna play knight to g5, that looks pretty good. And I'd like to put a piece here, a rook, a bishop, a knight, and it just sits there forever. That's one of the advantages of playing EF. He attacked my pawn and defended his bishop, and I played F3. See, when his queen was on D1, I wasn't gonna play F3 because he'd take it. Now, now I'm gonna play F3. So yeah, now his king is getting exposed. Played rook E1, very suspicious. I guess he wants to play bishop F1. King takes, bishop takes, and queen H4. Now he has many defenses to his h3 pawn, many. Okay, what is the only defense of his h3 pawn? There's only one. Rook e3, did he play rook e3? Hey, he did. And I assume I attacked it again. Yeah, I'm right. Yeah, so my bishop's better than his, and I don't think his knight's too good, and I think my king is better, and I have better pawn structure, otherwise it's equal. 
So this didn't work out well for him because usually, usually, not always, when you play knight e2, g3 to f5, you don't envision your knight going to h1 soon. That's not the goal. Okay. What would Hikaru say? Horrible. Okay, so now he goes crazy, e5, because he's losing, so time to go crazy. Okay, check. Well, if he blocks with the rook, I'll play knight f3 check, which I think is mate. Is that mate? So he probably didn't do that. If he plays king h2, I'll play queen g2 mate. So I guess he played knight g3. Yay, what a guess. <laughs> check. Yeah, now if he moves his king, I'll play knight takes e5 or d takes e5. Yeah. Now he's down two pawns, but he has good comp. Okay, and I guess he resigned soon. Okay, he resigned here. Okay, so that game worked out well for me because my opponent's knight, you know, he was doing a Bob Seeger thing over here, working on his knight moves. But I'm from Ann Arbor, so that didn't stop me. Anybody get that joke? My next game didn't go so long. If you thought that guy didn't last long, wait till this guy. Now, this is a funny story, although it's not too funny. I've known this guy for years, and while driving to this tournament, this exact tournament, as I got off the freeway and I went to turn to go to the, to the building the tournament was in, I saw him selling flowers on the side of the road. So I was confident he wasn't a professional chess player. Maybe he is. Okay. So I did the same thing as usual. And he did something else. He played f3. Never play f3. Okay, and that's a solid center. I did my usual Fustafazu here. Okay, now I played a6, and maybe I'll play b5. And he played h4. So he makes a lot of pawn moves. I don't know, that's a lot of pawn moves. Maybe too many. h6, I love playing h6. And again, if he plays h5, and my knight moves away, I'll get to play my bishop g5 thing again. I like to do that. And he played g4. Yeah, don't play g3, then g4. Although, Yuri Shulman's wife, Victoria Nee, in this opening did play g3, then g4, the next move. Now, g4 is much better on g3, because on g3, my knight can't do anything. Now my knight can do everything. Now I don't know what to do with my knight. I'm so happy. <clears throat> so... I don't understand this g3, g, the second person's done it against me. g3, then g4. If you're playing me, do that. Play, don't, the pawns only move one square. <laughs> g4 is extremely aggressive, but g3, then g4, you're losing a tempo. Okay, knight h7, threatening the h4 pawn 8,000 times. Like my queen, my bishop, my knight. So he moved it. Knight h4, what's the threat? Winning a queen is good. Knight takes f3. Who wants to defend it? What do you suggest? King to f2. Yeah, I agree with that. Knight to g1. Knight to g1. Hmm, no, king f2 I like. Makes more sense to me. Knight g1, preparing for the next game. Setting up the pieces. Bishop g5. Hooray! And now you'll notice his bishop isn't so good. Very suspicious. So I traded off my bishop for his good bishop. And this game didn't go much longer. King f2, g6, opening up the king's side since his king is going for a walk. And castle, threatening f3, right? So you should probably defend that. Unfortunately, I'm also attacking g4. Man, this position is tough. It's rough, I tells you. So, yeah, this knight's here permanently. I got the open line to his king. This is a threat. This is a threat. This is a threat. I pre-defended this. And his bishop is permanently bad on g2. Maybe king g3 survives. Did he play that? Not bishop e2. Terrible. And then he resigned. That's how you play white. No, no horrible. No. Okay, but I've actually had more than one person play g3, then g4. Terrible. But notice, as soon as all the pawns get blocked up, 
Then both sides start to play on the flank. I was like, oh, I could play a6, b5. Then I was like, oh, I'll just checkmate him. Because a lot of guys castle queenside, and then I play for mate was b5. And my favorite game possibly in my life, possibly, is the next one. Then I'll show you that I was losing. Although I was losing this game too. Okay, this is against everybody's favorite player. The best player from Kansas in history. Conrad Holt. What was the other answer? I don't know anybody. He's the only person from Kansas I know. So it's Karpov. Karpov, what? Karpov, born and bred in Kansas. Yeah, if you go to Wikipedia, that's what it says. Okay, I don't know about that. Maybe he claims to be. Maybe he flies over and says, hi, chess school. Okay, so this was before Conrad Holt was Conrad Holt. Uh, you know, he still had all the flailings and stuff, but he didn't, it wasn't 2600 yet. And this was the last round of a tournament, and I had to win because I wanted to get my $40. If I draw, I get like a dollar. So I wanted to get some more money. And Conrad Holt was 23, 2400. He was an up and coming junior. And this is the craziest game I've ever played. And uh, Dmitry Gurevich really liked it, he was very excited. Okay, so I played my usual, I mean, blocked position. Okay, but I'm playing Conrad Holt, so you don't mess around now. That guy's not bad. He played just knight f3, developed his knight. He played to play on the queen side with a3 and b4. I did my usual knight maneuver. He played g3, killing my knight on g6. I hate when they do that. I like playing knight f4 and winning. When they play pawn here, my knight can't go anywhere. I hate when that happens. Okay, so I played castles, h4. Now a lot of you are afraid to play knight h8, but I'm not. And the reason I'm not is because of a game I played with Anand back in the day, okay, in 1986, when he played knight h8 for no reason, although it was a good move. And so I like playing knight h8, it's my favorite move. So whenever my opponents play h5, I play knight h8, and I'm like, so. So knight e8, and then knight h8. That's how you play chess. And then if I can get my bishop over here somehow, I'm all set. Okay. Yeah, now, as uh, Preston pointed out earlier, I'm ready to play f5. And when I play f5, my knight can come to f7. Hooray. So he developed his bishop for some reason, and I played f5, as I said. And now he followed the Feingold rule, which I have for my students, when your opponent plays f5, what do you do, Joe? It's my rule. Uh, don't you, you take it. Don't do anything. No, no, you take it. Yeah. That's my rule. f5, you take it. Otherwise, I'll play f4. Hooray. Okay, so he took, and I took with my bishop, and he played knight h4. And now, I was like, hmm, which bishop should I give up? Should I let him take this bishop, or should I take that that way, or should I retreat? And they all looked bad, because if my bishop retreats, let's say to d7, then his knight goes to e4. This guy plays better than my previous opponents. He actually gets his pieces out. <clears throat> so I got rid of my bad bishop and put my knight on a better square. Queen to d2, h6. And he castled, which surprised me. I thought his king would walk over to g2, and I thought since he has two bishops, he has an advantage. <clears throat> now that we've castled opposite sides, as Prince would say, it's time to... Ah, oh, they never heard of Prince. Let's go, let's go crazy. Okay. It's time to let the dubs cry. I don't know, maybe. Okay, so... So I want to open up his king, and he wants to open up my king, and the game gets really exciting. A little too exciting, if you ask me. A6, what's my next move? B5. He plays rook f1, which really confused me, and still does. I played b5. And he's like, oh boy, a free pawn, hooray. So he's up a pawn, but his king is a little iffy. Well, he has two bishops. King b2, defending his a pawn and getting off the open c file. e4, opening up this diagonal to his king and hoping my knight gets to go to e5, possibly sacking another pawn. f4, stopping knight e5. I hate when they do that. e3, sacrificing to open against his king. 
He's like, nope, queen d4. And I unpinned my knight and defended my e-pawn. So this has been a very complicated game where the center was closed, and now the center is not closed. Now it's opening up. And we castled opposite sides. But this is really good because we both had to win to win a prize. And you'll see that Conrad Holt likes to play for a win. There's no draws. Rook f3 attacking my pawn. Bishop e4, which was a terrible move. Ah. So this is actually quite funny. Uh, at this point, I was walking around. And I was like, hmm, if my bishop wasn't here, I could play knight f5, forking his queen and rook. And I was like, I wonder if I'll get a chance to do that. And he played rook f3. And I was like, oh boy, bishop e4 attacking his rook, and then knight f5 forking his queen and rook. But yeah, bishop e4 is terrible. Yeah. And he played rook g4, threatening mate. My bishop was on f5, stopping that. My bishop on f5 was containing his rook. But then I went crazy. How do you stop mate? Stopping mate's good. Knight f5. And he played rook takes g7 check. Now the problem is, if I take his rook, he'll play knight takes bishop, and then f6 is a bit tender. And computer says like plus 1,000 for white. So I played the obvious move. That was a joke, but it's not obvious. King f8's illegal. Wrong class. That's the earlier class. King h8 allowing all kinds of discovered checks. But his queen's hanging, so. Now it's complicated. Ah. But that's good, because somebody has to win to win a prize. Draw is no good. And you may notice, when you look at international chess, that Americans are terrible. I hope you notice that. And the reason, but it's not our fault. It's, it's not our fault. When we play in tournaments, we're required to win every game. If you go to the World Open, you got to get a lot of points. If you go to the National Open or the Chicago Open, you got to get a lot of points. If you win and draw and win and draw and win and draw, then you win like $10. But if you go win, 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 then you get $20,000. That's better. If you play in a round robin tournament in Europe where everybody's a super grandmaster, you could have seven draws and three wins and get clear first because everybody's a super grandmaster. <laughs> so the good players, they play solid and they don't make any mistakes, and they have a lot of draws. American players like Shabalov, Christensen, who play in Swiss, they, they got to win. You can't have a lot of draws. So we play like this. And then sometimes we lose. It looks bad. Conrad Holt has a lot of games like this. He's winning and losing. Terrible. No draws. Uh, Timur Gureyev has a lot of games like this. Some of you played him in the Simul, right? It was like 12 hours, remember? What? Come on, I don't believe that. Next thing you know, you'll tell people he beat me in seven moves. OK, so, so my opponent played rook g4 check. And, the, and I played the obvious move. No, king h7. Come on. So if I play knight takes queen, which seems obvious, then he takes with check. Now I have some problems. Ah, God, you guys suggest the worst. Ah, every move wins for white. I'm so confused. Let's see. Pawn takes looks good. No, knight takes bishop looks good. What about the, uh, what about the rook come on down with the check? And then when you take it with his rook, then you take the knight. Well, you take it with the king, though. Huh? The king could take. Oh, OK. Yeah. I hate when that happens. I'm thinking about that thing. For some reason, I'm thinking the rook for stay. Ninety-five, terrible, yeah. horrible. Yeah. Hmm. What's wrong with taking the bishop? That's what I'm looking at. Looks good. Everybody's attacking everybody. I'm so confused in this position. Knight takes, queen takes. Where's my Houdini? Wait, queen. What is there Houdini on this? Because it's gonna say like plus twenty for white. I know it does. What there is. Terrible. Who would use Houdini? Well, me. Ah, horrible. Okay, so I played King H7 because that's more interesting. 
And now we could have had a draw. Rook g7, king h8, draw. But we didn't do that. He played queen d1 playing for the win. Rook c8, and now we just have a normal position where I'm down the exchange. But his rooks are funny. Some funny rooks. Knight d6, and I have compensation. Rook takes c3. I should have shown this in my lecture yesterday. Yeah, that's actually the best move. It takes you D like an hour to find it. And then queen c7, and white has no attack. I've stopped all his attack. And his rooks are terrible. And now my favorite move of the game, not rook c8, b4. That was my favorite move of the game. I'd give it all away for a little more. Now bishop takes is weak because queen takes queen check. You guys saw that, right? What's that? A takes, what he did. Knight check, takes. And now since I played b4, the a file is open, so I'm ready for a rook here, rook here. And his rooks are terrible. But he's Conrad Holt. So he plays a move so amazing that you won't even believe me, unless it was the next move. Queen takes e3. He insists on giving his queen away. So why didn't I take it? Yeah, exactly. Rook check, king here, rook here check. And actually, white's winning, even though some guy told me black's winning. White's winning. So I played rook a8, threatening mate. Who needs a queen? My knight's better than a queen. And he blundered with rook f1 in time trouble. And then he resigned because queen c2 is going to be mate. Hooray. I showed him. And now nobody's ever heard of Conrad Holt. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> No, but after rook a8, he's minus 1,000. He's already completely lost. Rook a8, the only winning move. OK, and the last game is a very funny game. Uh, twice in my life, uh, I've played Irina Crush. Uh, I mean, I've played her more than twice. But twice I've played her where she was up a rook and a piece. Usually that's not good. And it wasn't intentional. That's just what happened. And I drew both games. OK, this game. After this game ended, there was a hole in her hotel room wall soon thereafter, which had to be paid for. Not by me. I didn't do it. OK, so this game didn't work out so well for me, except when I swindled a draw down a rook and a piece. OK, so we had our usual starting position. And Irina played bishop e2, a move we haven't seen. I played my usual, you know, what I usually do. And she played knight e1. Now, why did she play knight e1? What's the plan? It's actually the same plan I had. Yeah, she's going to play knight to d3 probably, and probably f4. Because when you have this closed position here, you want to you know, play on the, on the flank. And so far, nobody's been playing f4 against me, although Irina did. I castled. She played g3, knight g2, and then f4, which is almost what, I, what Yester likes to do with black. And she traded off her bishop, her bad bishop, for my good bishop. Terrible. What's funny is, uh, after all these things happened, uh, by the way, whenever your opponent plays f4, you take it. If they play f5, then you can't move. A uh, computer says black's better here. I know you guys like black. I like black. Yeah? See, there you go. I've changed my opinion. White's better. Uh, <laughs> all of a sudden. Um, yeah, this position is very strange. We have isolated pawn. Both sides are attacking. Everybody's pieces are misplaced. It's not clear what she'd be doing. But, but she played better than I did in this position. Uh, black is still better here. And then I played knight h5 horrible. Ah, terrible. I should just double rooks and keep pressure on these pawns. But I played knight h5, rook f3. And then I played knight f8, which is also a bad move. And g6 is a bad move. And now I'm losing. I hate when that happens. So white got to push forward in the center. And this is a typical uh, move in Benoni, Benko, anything, e5. White wants to play knight e4. And then the knight is doing a lot of stuff. And it's hard to play knight e4 when your pawn's on e4. So often white sacrifices it. Most famous example, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, Pause for laughter. 
is the game Jonathan Penrose, Mikhail Tall. What's that? See, there you go. And you, you'll have noted that Tall did not win. Because it was E4, then E5, then F5. Rawr. Okay, so I took, and then knight E4. Now, some of you may notice that the knight is pinned. Did you notice that? So occasionally, knight F6 check is good. Right? Agreed. Yeah. I think I made a mistake here, too. I try to make a mistake every move. That keeps my opponent off balance. <laughs> Queen G7, D6, uh-oh, knight C5. And yeah, now the computer is getting sort of mad at me because white's going to make a queen and win a rook and so forth. So white busted through the center, just like in the previous game with Holt, I busted through the center. Uh, even though the center is completely blocked, sometimes it opens up. And that she's taking all my pawns and queening. Ugh, I hate when that happens. I didn't resign, though. OK, so now I'm down a piece. That's pretty good. And ah, this is the key position. So here she's plus 11. Plus 11 is good. If you're taking notes, write that down. And she made a move where it was equal. Don't do that. Well, if you're playing me, then do that. OK, white to play and win. Very nice tactic that she didn't see. Probably time trouble. 98, which forks my king and queen. You agree. So I would play rook takes knight. And then rook takes h7. Right. Yeah. And then uh, computer's not so happy. Although it's happy if you're white. And computer says plus 11. Yeah, I think I'm down a queen. So I'd probably lose. No, I don't think so. I think this would have been the final position. <laughs> well, I think, I think this would have been the final position. OK, so instead of winning, Irina played knight takes f4, assuming that I would take with the pawn and she would do the same thing. But I took with the queen. And now this is actually a draw. It's actually not winning anymore. Because I'm only down a rook and a knight. So. And if I check from in front, the rook can block. But if I check from the side, nothing can block. So I check from the side. Then I can keep checking from the side. If king g4, queen d4 check, and just check on the d file. So draw. And we agreed to a draw here. But basically, I can check here. And then her pieces can't stop me. Yeah, that was not a good tournament for her, because she was like plus 100 in every game and was losing and drawing anyway. And I was minus 100 every game and losing. Terrible. You know, Robert has played in that tournament. He wasn't a good player yet. We were beating up on him. I mean, we are not in chess. We were just beating up on him. Yeah. So uh, generally, when the center is blocked, you try to advance on the flank. And occasionally, 30% of the time, the center opens up later because somebody attacks on the flank with f5 or f4, or b5 or b4, and then things open up. And hopefully they'll up to your advantage because your pieces are well placed. In this instance, it was good for white. In my game with Holt, it was also good for white, but he got confused. Sort of looks confused when the game starts. Uh, right? You know what I'm saying. <laughs> OK. And then uh, sometimes my opponents don't seem to know what to do at all, and I just go forward on the king side, and they lose right away, which I like. And the reason is I've had this position many times so I have some idea what to do. And I've, I don't know anybody else who plays this way with black. And when I saw Anand do it in a game 30, I was like, hey, I'm going to do that, because nobody knows that. So now you guys all know it, so I'll have to play something else. Because now, and, it's, and you at home, forget what I told you. Yeah. But uh, yeah, Irina didn't have any trouble. Now, for those of you who are on the internet, it's this newish thing they have. Uh, there's something called Chess Life Online. Well, it's better than chess base. But anyway, uh, there was an article recently, I think yesterday, about the World Open. If you want to see a game like this that Irina was also winning, which she didn't win, uh, was against Tomasz Galashvili. There's actually a video about it, too. And she talks about the game. I was winning, I was losing, I was winning, I was losing, there was a draw. And there was also a blocked 
position like this, and they both opened up on both sides, and all heck broke loose. See, heck, see? See? I don't even work here anymore. Uh, and that game ended in a draw, but it was very similar to this game. Like, it was just totally crazy after the position opened up. I think Irina plays these positions well, but her fault, in, when she gets a winning position, she's in time trouble. And if she had half an hour left when she was winning, she'd win every game. But when she has five minutes, then you know, sort of a toss-up. And to finish on the Irina bashing, uh, there was a game Irina played against Shabalov where she was plus 14 in a Sicilian, and Shabalov was going to resign every move, but he never did. Irina had a minute left and, and blundered and lost in the US Championship a few years ago. So one of the problems in these positions is if you do get a winning position, they're so weird that it's possible you're going to have no time on your clock when you get that winning position. So what do I recommend? Playing the opening a lot, not just once a year, and saying like, hmm, what do I do here? I've had so many games in this block position that I usually have a good idea what to do and when to play F5 and when to play B5, and still I'm losing every game, man. Terrible opening. Uh, and Anand got crushed against Mikhail Gurevich, and he stopped playing it. Terrible, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, Spencer's here, so class dismissed. Yeah. Very good. No, not really. We'll, we'll continue on. I tricked you. Oh. Uh, so before you showed up, we were talking about closed positions, because he said so. Yeah. yeah, when they're blocked in the middle, and what you should be doing. And let's do a more generic, well, actually, I can just do this. Ha ha, I tricked chess base. Okay. So like, in this position, in my opinion, nine times out of 10, especially if you're West, you want to play the move B4. So you want to play rook B1 and B4, or A3 and B4. Now I want to show you a trick that a lot of my blitz opponents fall into. Okay, they play bishop G5, horrible, even though it's illegal. Horrible, yeah, horrible. Okay, your bishop doesn't belong on G5, because black, as you saw in previous games, even Spencer saw, he wasn't here. As you saw in previous games, Black was trying to trade this bishop for this bishop. So bishop g5 is very helpful. And also, <clears throat> white's going to probably castle king's side, if at all. And so it, bishop g5 doesn't help do that. Terrible. And you're walking into selected traps. In some positions, probably not this one, black can play the move knight takes d5, and then your flag would fall. He's so confused. Right? Look at Ken West. His flag's down five times already. Why do you say not this <clears throat> Well, in this position, I think black, uh, white can do a counter trick. Bishop takes, although I could take this. I was looking at knight e7, knight b5, and then I was all confused. Then I resigned both sides. This has got to still be good, this has got to still be good, for, good, good for, for black. Queen a5 castles. Knight takes c3 might be good. Right, but this knight takes d5 trick, it works sometimes. And possibly, knight takes e4 works. Possibly. And then if takes, you take this, and then I'm, I'm too old for this. But in speed chess, this works out well. Possibly for white, but... But you have to watch out for this trick every move. Is this move good? Is this move good? So don't, don't go there. Terrible. And then you make it real easy for black to trade off his bishop if those moves don't win. So in this opening, white never plays bishop g5. White's bishop stays here, and he controls the whole diagonal, and he's waiting for black to go here and trade bishops. I've actually had a lot of people not develop their bishop ever because they're waiting for bishop g5. They don't want to lose a tempo. <clears throat> and as you saw the first game, my opponent Fien kettled his bishop and put it on the side of the board terrible where he couldn't do anything. Play like bishop b2 and then he just stayed there the whole game doing nothing. Answer. <clears throat> yes, f4 is playable. Now you have a problem with that. When you play f4, which Yasser would like, you have to, well, black always has to take. You have to be careful that black doesn't get control of the e5 square with his knight. Then you're just going to be worse. So positions where, like, for example, if knight here, knight here, knight g4, terrible move bishop at e3, and then oh, I still can't play bishop f6. Rawr. So I want to play knight e5 and keep a piece there. And here you can actually play f4. You can do it. And that's what Steve Feldman likes to do. He's a FIDE master in Michigan. Right, and black is trying to put his pieces on 
on e5. So maybe castles, rook e8, and then bishop f8, and then let's say castles, knight d7, and black is trying to play flip board. Black's trying to play this. And if black can have a piece sit on e5, that's going to be very unpleasant for white. If white can get e5 in, that's going to be very unpleasant for black because white's going to have a pass d pawn. So that's sort of a fight for who's going to get e5 first. Maybe white would play h3 here, stopping knight g4. Black would play g6, bishop g7. And we have sort of a funny Benoni. Funny Benoni. Uh, f4 is the most aggressive move. And I face it in blitz chess a lot. But in a slow game, nobody's ever played f4 against me. Although I think that's the move Yasser likes. He was talking about f4 earlier. f4. And what you have to remember is if you play this closed system, you, you really want to play f5 with white. Then black, then you just checkmate him. This bishop's terrible. So I, I always take this pawn. Even in situations where, where white can take with the g pawn. And you might think, no, white center's too good. I can't let him do that. Well, <clears throat> white has a lot of weaknesses around his king. You know, bishop can go here check sometimes. You can attack these pawns on e4 and f4. So it looks good, but sometimes you get in trouble. For example, knight to g4, and then bishop to h4 check, and f5, and so forth. Like, could be dangerous for white. Because the center's being open, but black's castled and white hasn't. So you got to be careful when you move all your pawns up like that. And I think Irina did it just right. <clears throat> she castled, then she played g3, f4, and she was ready to, to do stuff. The computer still liked my game. That was awesome. Oh, I was getting crushed. But f4 is a very dangerous move for both sides. If, if your opponent plays knight e5 and has a knight sitting in there, I've done that, then I, I win those games. But if my opponent plays e5, I still draw somehow. Somehow. Now, of course, that doesn't cover the cornucopia of closed centers. Uh, some closed centers are actually positions like e4, e5, and then d5. You get this kind of closed center. Not this exact position, but this kind of closed center. And the ones I was showing you, there were pawns here. So if we look at some kind of Rui Lopez, you'll see that often black is trying to play c6 or occasionally f5, uh, although it's hard to play c6 in the position I was showing you because the pawn was on c5 already. So these kind of closed centers are a little different. One thing that I see you guys do wrong a lot, and I'm talking to all of you. No. Some of you guys do this. I, I've seen it before. You'll play d5 when like, your bishop's on c4. Very suspicious. So you might have some position like this, and white's playing d5 because it attacks the knight. But it makes this bishop look awfully silly. So that's usually not a good idea, because now the bishop isn't good. And later, black can play f5 and h6 and bishop g5 and play the ways I was showing you. And he has to lose a tempo. <clears throat> it's usually OK to lose a tempo or two when everything's completely blocked. And to, for the opposite view, when it's open, you can't lose a tempo or two. See the game played today between Wang Hao and Anish Giri, your two favorite players, right? Yeah, some of you have heard of him. And uh, Wang Hao sacrificed to peace, and the center was completely open, and Giri's king was running around open center. There was no immediate mate, but it was a long-term thing. Here, with the center completely blocked, then sometimes you can move around a lot, and you're not going to get mated because there's no way through. So you can maneuver more. And it's actually common in block positions for black or white to start moving their knight around a lot to find a good square. It loses tempi, but eventually the knight gets to a good square. And this knight, which obviously is on a good square, has nowhere to go. Can't go here, can't go here, can't go here, can't go here. So that's why Irina was playing knight e1 and making way for her f pawn. <clears throat> so block centers are different than open centers. And as one of my friends pointed out, you don't see that that often. And that's why I like to play these positions with black. People who have white think I have a space advantage and my pieces are really good on f3 and c4, but they're not really that good. 
Bishop on c4 is completely blocked. The knight's not doing anything. Those pieces were better here <clears throat> when the bishop was open and the knight was putting pressure on e5. So that's why d5 just basically kills two of white's pieces. But good question, whoever asked it, whatever the question was. <laughs> yeah. All right, and now it's time for Thai food. Mm -hmm.